every life is a journey, a continuous exploration of what makes us. Most explore ways to live it. A very few dedicate their whole lives to the exploration. From studying the building blocks of the universe to exploring the vast realm of consciousness, if one can truly say, I have tried, it would be Professor Sri Kantan. We have only a handful of people throughout history who can make that claim. Spanning a career of more than 60 years, seeking from the quantum to the cosmic and exploring the realm of consciousness through discerning scientific inquiry, he is still actively contributing through his passion for research. Professor Sri Kantan's journey has many facets a brilliant scholar, a passionate researcher, an institution builder, a philosopher, voracious reader, a doting mentor, and above all, a gentle human. He has been at the frontier of science for the last five decades and has been a pioneer in the scientific approach to consciousness studies over the past two decades. A physicist by training, an experimental physicist by profession, and a student of consciousness study by nature, he is a unique example of the true spirit of dedicating a life to exploration. The renaissance of experimental science in India is uh, Baba's legacy. He picked Sri Kantan as the leader to realize his dream of making India self-sufficient in variety of experimental sciences. You know, I know Professor Sri Kantan, I think now it's almost 50 years since I came in contact with him for the first time when I was a student at the Physical Research Laboratory. For all that he had achieved even by that time, and I've not from 1965-66, he was a very modest person, a person who was very humble, the way in which he deals with others and especially with students. Uh, he had a very special way to deal with them one of encouraging them, one of inspiring them and that was very unique. Uh, to, to me anything which is a complex problem and the problem has a lot of science in it and without science there is no complexity for a problem and so and whenever such a problem is posed I always used to go to him and he used to break it up into the elements in which you can start understanding it. Professor Sikandam, oh, he is I think the most jovial, friendly person and I think um, it's, it's not easy to find uh, such a person. You know, he's very active, all the time working, thinking about something or other of the experiment. And um, absolutely, I think it was uh, a joy to work with him. As a director, I think uh, he, he did a lot to, <coughs> to start new areas of research and to encourage uh, people to take up new areas of research and give all support. Bharata Shastrajna Kantamala lo Raja Magutambu Vivu. What that means is in the uh, necklace of Indian scientists you are the crown jewel. Professor Sikantan may be the only scientist in the world who has worked deep underground laboratories at a depth of 2.7 km underground, then on the surface of the earth using various cosmic ray air shower experiment on mountain altitude at Uti and also on balloon experiment several hundred kilometers above the earth's surface. Initiated by Baba into high energy physics and cosmic ray studies, Professor Sri Kantan was the keystone to many of the pioneering groundbreaking researches conducted in India and the world over, ushering a paradigm shift in the scientific understanding of high energy physics. From 15,000 feet deep underground to 2 kilometers high in the atmosphere and satellite payloads to carry out X-ray studies in space, as the director of TIFR, he helped Professor Swaroop in establishing GMRT, the world's largest radio telescope at Kodat, and Professor Ramnath Kaushik to establish the second highest optical telescope at Hanley. Professor Shrikantan was instrumental in setting up vital facilities 
from concept to implementation. If India has been on par with the world and has taken huge strides in the area of modern cosmic studies, it can undoubtedly be attributed to Professor Srikantan. His journey started in the traditional temple town of Nanjangud in the year 1925. Being the fifth son in an orthodox Brahmin family of the famous Ayurvedic practitioner B.B. Pandit and Lakshmi Devi, young Srikantan was exposed and groomed to the regimen of acquiring traditional knowledge and practices. Being exposed to the processes of manufacture of Ayurvedic medicines, recitals and traditional practices of sacred texts, the young mind was already preparing to launch to a different realm of exploration. With brothers pursuing varied interests from Ayurveda to philosophy and Marxism, Professor Srikantan traces to the fact that he had Marx in one hand and Shankara in the other, which influenced his whole exploration of life. Very early in his life, he became interested in the philosophy of science and the scientific way of looking at everything. There's an age gap of nine years, so I don't know much about uh, I don't have much interaction with him. We had a guru called Narsim Bhatt and so I studied this uh, Prasthanatraya we call. So I know little philosophy and Sri Kantin is a great philosopher. So whenever we meet we will be discussing these philosophical matters and derive. I mean pleasure out of that and know many things also. The hard work and knowledge is something that uh, I should say I inherited from my father and from my brothers. They, my father was exceedingly hard working. He would get up very early in the morning and then uh, he would sleep almost around 10 o'clock in the night. We all wondered about the way he used to cycle even at the age of uh, 55, 60. And he also used to play tennis. So even at that age. So hard work was something that was, uh, I think, uh, we caught on from my father. My brother also, he was very studious and uh, he was a scholar in uh, not only Ayurveda, which he studied in Mysore Ayurveda College. My father also was a graduate from the Mysore Ayurveda College. And uh, he also had a lot of interest in philosophy. So whatever later on I became, is partly through the influence of my eldest brother who used to discuss with me all the profound questions of life. That's why I got interested in philosophy. And it was he who suggested that I should uh, I grow up going to physics. With this spirit of inquiry rooted by the immediate intellectual atmosphere and the burning desire to explore, young Sri Kantan developed a compelling interest in science at school. After initial schooling at Nanjangud, he set off to Mysore. It was the book Grammar of Science by Carl Pearson and a few others that kindled the interest of Sri Kantan because they raised fundamental questions about philosophy, matter and life. Sri Kantan attributes his molding solely to the teachers he had in college. In early life, I had very good teachers throughout. In my schools, I had very good teachers. And uh, in Central College where I studied, you see, there were very good teachers in physics and in mathematics. In fact, the mathematics department was supposed to be one of the best in uh, India. They were models for us in the sense that uh, they were really scholars in their field. And, um, and of course, Subramanya used to uh, teaches physics. Sometimes the lecture would start at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. We would end at 6.30 in the evening. Four hours he would uh, give a lecture on uh, phys in physics basically. So they were all, uh, you know, model in terms of uh, uh, lectures and the dedication for this and laboratory practice also. We did a lot of uh, experimentation. That was one very good thing that was there. Now, you see, most of the colleges, they are not even laboratories. They show it on the TV, what the results of an experiment are, how the experiment is done. Hands-on experience is not there at all, actually. And that is why when I, uh, I went through the system, both in the college 
and later on when I joined TIFR, building everything myself, every electronic circuit was built by me. An avid reader all through his life, Srikantan read an enormous number of classics and used to collect second-hand books. He would read a lot of fiction, liked Agatha Christie and H.G. Wells was a favourite. He also read a lot of Kannada literature. I was a sportsman. I used to play tennis and uh, of course very young I used to play cricket but afterwards tennis was my strong uh, point and uh, even at TIFR you may be surprised that Ramana and I were competitors for the first place and I in tennis I uh, you know was better than him. Sri Kantan studied the BSc honors from 1943 to 46 and MSc from 46 to 47 at the Central College with his brother studying Ayurveda and chemistry and supporting the family vocation, Sri Kantan was free to choose his dream of education. Sri Kantan chose physics and wanted to specialize in wireless communication which had electronics in it. You see, in 1943, I came to join Central College to Bangalore and uh, I had finished my intermediate in Mysore. My interest in uh, doing science came from my family. My interest during those days influenced by one teacher by name Professor Brahmaya was mostly in theoretical physics. I studied quite a bit of mathematics necessary at that time to enter the field of theoretical physics like group theory and other uh, things. My Though I joined Indian Institute of Science, my heart was set on doing physics, either at uh, Delhi with uh, Professor Kothari, or doing nuclear physics, theoretical nuclear physics, at Calcutta. And at that time, the only person who was known to work in the field of uh, nuclear physics was Professor D.M. Bose. And I wrote to these people, and they both very gave me positive replies saying that you can come and join and do your PhD here. Then what happened was Professor Chatterjee with whom I was working at the Communication Engineering, he told me that Dr. Baba has started this new institute called the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research and uh, I should try to go there and Baba is right now in uh, Bangalore. Uh, you can call on him, uh, you fix up an appointment and see him. I tried to meet Baba uh, fixing an appointment the next day, but uh, somehow that uh, I have spoken about it already elsewhere also. That did not rectify. After almost a year, but in the meantime, I learned a lot of electronics from Professor Chatterjee. And uh, that was a great uh, help that changed my entire career. Next year, I applied for TIFR. And uh, when I went to Bombay for the interview, uh, first I was interviewed for um, ex experimental physics. Baba was the chairman of the committee. And uh, there are two or three others. And later on, I was asked to come, I was to go back and then uh, another committee interviewed me with again Bhava there and then uh, uh, Professor Kosambi who was a mathematician. So as soon as I entered Bhava told them that look I have examined his physics, it's okay, now you can examine him in uh, mathematics. So they asked me a few questions in uh, uh, group theory and also uh, determinants and things like that. And then, uh, then Hava said, okay, go, but wait on. Then I waited for some more time. Some other students who had come for interview were interviewed. Then I was called for the third time. When I went there, Hava said that uh, Sri Kandam, we have decided to admit you. Now you tell me, do you want to do theoretical physics or do you want to do experimental work? I told him, sir, you have interviewed me, you know best what I am uh, suited for. And he laughed and he said, look young man, if you join theoretical work, then there is no 
possibility that he will become an experimentalist. But the other way, there is some small probability that he can still do theoretical work. And uh, I, I find that in India there are very few people who know ele electronics. So if I were you, I would uh, like you to join the experimental work. But the choice is yours. Then I immediately said, uh, whatever you say, I accept. That is how I got into the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. The community was much smaller. But the types of experiments that were done were absolutely fundamental. And uh, the type of equipment that was required for that was fabricated in the laboratories. Not like today, you know, if you want to do an experiment at CERN, you have to can order many things, you have to design the experiment, and then you have to spell out your requirements, and then uh, the commercial people will come and uh, uh, sell you everything. But uh, during those days it was not so. In fact, we had to do everything with our own hands. There we had a disadvantage in India compared to other countries because nothing was available. And you know, in 1950s, our industry was one of the most backward ones. We did not even produce stainless steel, you see, in uh, Tukhokovic. And the electronics was unheard of, actually, kind of. Uh, so what I did and what Dr. Ramana, who was my contemporary at that time in the IR form, he started nuclear physics there. We were going to Mahadali Road, Bombay, buying electronic equipment from South. And there would be a lot of electronic equipment which was not suitable for our work, which we had to adapt them to whatever we wanted to do. But we had cheap valves and then condensers and resistors, everything for electronics was available. We had to build everything else. So you see, those days, the type of research was very different, you know. In our country, we had to build everything, and then they, when these scientists came and admired us, it is because we were taking so much uh, interest in building equipment in, uh, from the scratch, actually. That is the kind of uh, approach we had. That helped us quite a lot. And that gave us tremendous confidence when we went abroad that we are as good as them or better actually. We went to Kola Goldfields first time. And then we were very happily received by the uh, mining authorities at that time, John Taylor and company. And uh, by October, Nan and myself started the experiments. Of course, the first thing was to measure the intensity of uh, new mesons as a function of depth. And then we realized that to do the experiment that he had proposed, we needed very much more, uh, uh, you know, type of uh, detectors, this and that. But we continued that. And then as we were getting to some reasonable depth, and also we put a cloud chamber in the uh, mines and uh, started looking at some anomalous events and all that. The mining people said they are going to close down the mines. So we had to leave. Then we went to Khandala and the tunnel we did the experiment, the cloud chamber experiment. Then it so happened in 1958, you see, Ramana Muthi had joined us even on the first experiment, second experiment. He was keen on doing underground experiment. So he found out that the mines had not closed down and they will continue for some more time. So that is how we went again back to KGF. And then we, as you know, you are part of it. We started the air shower array at the top and then we had already started an experiment in Uti for air showers. So as an extension of that, we started this work. That uh, activity we started in 1951 lasted till 1992 in Kola Gold A variety of experiments were done. The, and of course, the most important was the uh, neutron uh, cosmic ray neutrino detection, basically. And then we ran for almost 10 years the search for proton decay. Professor Srikanthan was asked to select a site for uh, high energy cosmic ray studies using high altitudes. He visited various locations and finally chose Uti as an ideal site for doing cosmic ray studies and work began here in 1955. One of the important characteristics 
of Professor Srikantan, which sets him apart from many other scientists, is his emphasis on developing state-of-the-art instruments in-house. And it was this emphasis and his unique capability as an experimentalist which allowed a small group of scientists, most of them uh, students of Professor Srikantan and himself, to develop world-class instrumentation with meager resources that were available then. And with those resources do world-class science. And it continued for many decades. But this concept that you must develop instrumentation in-house so that you can optimize your detectors to suit exactly the physics or the science that you want to pursue and also to do in a cost-effective manner as well as in case the instrument fails to be able to repair it because the instrument was designed in-house. And this is a tradition that got deeply ingrained in all of us. Then in early 1980s, a situation came when the emphasis grew on other areas of science such as high-energy physics and the scientists working in cosmic ray physics started to move over into high-energy physics and the activities at UT started to decline. He said that many times in past people have said that there is no future in cosmic ray physics. However, whenever such statements were made, new discoveries were made and the field grew again and same thing is going to happen again. So you should not worry about it. You should carry on the science, try to do good science, build good instruments and pursue the science. In early 2000, we started work on development of high quality plastic scintillators, which otherwise had to be imported from abroad at very high costs. With the same philosophy of developing state-of-the-art instrument, we began a program for the development of high quality plastic scintillators, which are vital for detection of cosmic rays in 1998. It took us nearly three years to accomplish our mission and we could develop world-class plastic scintillators at a fraction of the cost of imported scintillators. Despite the fact that by that time he had uh, left TIFR and settled in Bangalore, he continued to keep keen interest and, and encourage us with his words of wisdom and advice which kept us going. Once we had achieved success with scintillators, we embarked upon development of high-speed electronics which was necessary to process cosmic ray induced signals which last only a billionth of a second. So we needed fast electronics which was again not available in the country, had to be imported at high cost. And this program took us another three or four years and then we succeeded in making uh, basic electronics such as amplifiers, discriminators, time to digital converters and a host of other devices. And once we had tasted that success, uh, um, all of us working in the laboratory now had the confidence that we can take up even more challenging problems. As a result of this vision of Professor Srikantan of giving emphasis to high quality instrumentation, we are now again competitive internationally. Professor Srikantan, apart from performing his normal duties as director, had some very interesting qualities which are worth uh, discussing. One of the things that uh, soon after taking over as director in 1975, he realized that there are not enough persons coming into experimental programs and especially in programs that require large scale development of instrumentation. So he decided to do something about it. And uh, after a lo lot of discussions within the faculty, with colleagues and so on, he came up with an idea of recruiting people directly after MSc in, in a traineeship program and uh, subsequent to a two-year period of traineeship, successful candidates could be absorbed as academic members into institute. He faced enormous opposition to the scheme uh, from all of almost all of his colleagues but he felt that there is a serious problem and that needs to be addressed. As a consequence of this uh, program of direct recruitment nearly 
40 of us including myself were recruited over a period of uh, three or four years it is that group of young scientists in the late 70s and early 80s who today form the backbone of experimental program in TIFR. I would consider this to be possibly the greatest legacy of Professor Shrikantan of training a large number of not only his own students but colleagues and students of other colleagues into experimental sciences. And uh, when you look back and see the contribution in cosmic ray physics that have come out of India, you would see a connection to Professor Shrikantan in some way or other, if not in the first generation, maybe second generation, third generation or fourth generation. I think that basically sums up his impact on this field of science. In fact, Shrikantan also did the first uh, uh, satellite, a mini satellite, it was called Bhaskara and that had an X-ray payload. He was my, basically my first mentor and a PhD guide and I had, uh, I uh, continued to work with him for a couple of years uh, till he became the director. But eventually as it turned out he uh, was my PhD examiner and he is the one who read my thesis and so on. So that was a very fruitful um, mentorship I had from him from 73 to almost 81. So eight years uh, was my on and off uh, relationship with him as student and guide. And uh, I think his uh, persistence with me and uh, you know, letting us do the way we are and lot of independence he gave which uh, you know encouraged us and so on and not only that he uh, also gave us a job in between even before we finished our PhD so you know and he had that much of belief or faith uh, that yes we will do something and so we always had this you know we can't let him down. He planted the seed that generated into a you know big effort and led to the growth of exoastronomy, first balloon born exoastronomy, rocket born exoastronomy, ultimately satellite born exoastronomy. So you can see that his such activities span from depth of 10,000 feet deep underground to several hundred meet kilometers above you know the earth's level to uh, space. So very few people are there who have such a broad canvas in which they have contributed right from particle physics, cosmic rays, to exoastronomy, to TV gamma astronomy. So there is this plane of these activities which you find very rare. In fact, I can't think of anybody else, okay, who has contributed to such a wide ranging areas of research as he has done. There was a big international collaboration between MIT, that is Massachusetts in uh, Institute of Technology in the U.S., a Japanese scientist, um, Oda, Minoru Oda, and Sri Kantan and few others, and scientists from MIT. And Oda was the brain behind this, and Sri Kantan, with his uh, tremendous experimental skills, was one of the people who was responsible for uh, working with it. They made a collimator of a very interesting kind. A set of wires were there like a grating and when the rocket rotated, they will get bips of the source depending upon in which direction it was and they got to know the direction of the source within about one degree or so. Even within one degree, if you look at a telescopic picture, there are millions of stars. But uh, finally they found out which was the star and it was a star in the constellation of Scorpius and they identified the source and uh, this was the first identified X-ray source and really gave rise to X-ray astronomy which produced black holes and neutron stars and every kind of wonderful things and this was the first beginning in this he participated in this experiment in uh, MIT and then he came back to India and started X-ray astronomy there and uh, astronomers like uh, Professor Agarwal, 
many other uh, Manchanda and many others, uh, yeah, Rao, they all started X-ray astronomy because of the leadership of uh, Sri Kantan. And including Kasur Rangan, who became an X-ray astronomer. He started as an X-ray astronomer, subsequently became a space scientist. Sri Kantan was an expert in establishing collaborations across the world. In fact, some of the <coughs> collaborators are still continuing their collaboration. That is, generation after generation, the established collaborations are continuing. All the work at UT was carried out jointly with him and many other uh, Japanese scientists. I don't recall all their names offhand, but even today, the major uh, GRAPES program that is going on under the leadership of uh, Professor Sunil Gupta has uh, two Japanese scientists who are permanently s sitting in uh, Wuti and they are doing this uh, job. So, <clears throat> similarly, his uh, efforts at uh, MIT uh, has led to continuing collaborations in X-ray astronomy. Especially in the early days, um, Sachiyo Hayakawa of, um, uh, I think, Nagoya University and his collaborators used to come to Hyderabad to fly balloons with instruments for uh, looking at uh, X-ray sources in the sky. So in this way, he it's a rare collaboration that continues without change over, uh, over the years. He established collaborations with uh, Durham for uh, deep underground work with uh, Professor Wolfendale and others. And uh, they brought in uh, some part of the equipment, mainly neon flash tubes. And here uh, the scintillators were built here in India and they built a huge detector for uh, doing uh, deep underground cosmic ray studies. See, across the world, there are very few people who can establish so many collaborations and maintain them. Hanley would have been thought as impossible, but for Sri Kantan standing behind me, I don't know whether I would have uh, dared to say that I will uh, go and build this <laughs> telescope there. He was there to support at all levels, technical, administrative, in terms of uh, getting to find the right person to do the right job. So this kind of a leadership in uh, making uh, proportional counters for uh, deep underground experiments, it is those proportional counters and the technology developed there are helping uh, Professor Sunil Gupta building the world class, beyond the world class. However, we are the leaders in that and Sunil Gupta deserves full credit for doing it. But inspiration for all this came from Sri Kantan. There are not many scientists who have had such a wide impact on people. And in, as though the kind of a nationalistic feeling that Baba had was transferred to him and he carried that inner vision of Baba forward and his students carry his vision forward and this kind of a continuity is a, is a wonderful thing for our country and I feel proud that I had an opportunity to work with him. Professor Shikantan is a remarkable man. Um, it's a great honor to talk about him because he has truly been one of the most inspirational figures in science that I have met with in my career. Uh, Professor Shikantan is remarkable for various reasons. The first quality about him that I think is absolutely astounding is how deeply passionate he is about science, about research, about knowledge. Professor Shikantan's contributions of course has been enormous. But in NIAS, he came very specifically for a purpose. He wanted to establish consciousness studies and the physics behind consciousness studies on a very firm domain. At the time that he joined NIAS, consciousness was a taboo word. 
not only for physicists but also for biologists. I think he was instrumental along with Professor Kapoor to start discussions on why we should perhaps look at the underlying mechanisms that may be responsible for consciousness both in biological systems but perhaps at a larger scale. He is of course a deeply spiritual man, he has been interested in Vedanta and somewhere he felt that physics, Vedanta, spirituality, consciousness become one seamless whole. All the people have been talking about the physics of consciousness or the biology of consciousness. Professor Srikantan is one of the few people who I think have been able to look beyond these boundaries. He has always thought that one could understand one aspect of consciousness by a limited enquiry through certain techniques accepted in that field. But perhaps we need to have a much more holistic understanding and ever since he joined NIAS, he has been fighting for that view, for that view to emerge, for people to be able to talk to each other about consciousness, about its different aspects. On a more personal front, he has always been very interested in animal cognition. So when I joined NIAS, in, and in fact he was one of the few people uh, who at that point encouraged me to work on animal consciousness, animal cognition, because he felt that by understanding the non-human species, we would be able to understand the evolutionary biology of consciousness. And he thought that was an important aspect that we need to understand because after all, we as humans are biological beings as well. One of the most astonishing uh, qualities that Professor Srikantan has is, as I said, his undying love for knowledge. If there is any paper that he thinks might be remotely interesting to any of his colleagues or associates, he would be the first person to email it to them. So many times he has stopped me or some of my other colleagues in the lift, in the corridors and has immediately launched into a fascinating discussion of certain aspects of science that he perhaps is not very familiar with but he's ever willing to learn. He is one man who I have found in spite of his deep knowledge has never been afraid to say that I do not know much about this. Could you tell me a little more? And this quest, I think, this search for knowledge is what has driven him till now. He is still willing to listen to every speaker who comes to Nias, engage with him or her and learn and push forward the boundaries of learning. I also wanted to narrate another story of Professor Srikantan when he was in TIFR, when he was director of TIFR and I was a doctoral student. Uh, this was in the late 1980s. It so happened that my father met with an accident in Calcutta. And in those days when there were no STD booths, uh, of course there were no mobile phones, uh, we were extremely dependent on the ordinary telephone, what is now the ordinary telephone, to be able to communicate. I remember that I would line up often for minutes on end in the telephone office at TIFR, uh, trying to get through to my home to find out how my father was, till Professor Shikantan, director, heard about this. And he personally called me to his office and he said, I heard that you've been in a bit of difficulty please come to my home, please use my personal telephone, which is in my residence. Uh, my wife will help you. Please talk to your family as much as you want from my home. It was a very emotional mo moment for me because I knew I was in difficulty, but could I ever expect a man as senior as him in the very traditionally hierarchical uh, scientific society of uh, Indian science. Could I have expected a man like him to have come to an ordinary doctoral student and asked him to use his personal telephone? Uh, Professor Srikantan is working on consciousness studies and physics maybe uh, around 20 years because he started before 2000. As soon as he joined here, he started to understand consciousness and its relation to neuroscience. So, uh, he contacted several uh, people in biology. That time, really uh, not many neuroscientists were there in Bangalore. So, uh, he was a lone man and some people 
from various disciplines they just came here they joined with him discussing some materials but no systematic study was done during that time uh, i i can say that much that uh, this is the only institute where a systematic effort has been taken to study consciousness physics and biology and uh, recently there are some uh, enthusiasm grown up in some other institute but uh, that still very in infant stage on the other hand nias has developed uh, they have recruited some faculties and serious worker so they are studying seriously on relations between philosophy quantum theory and biology he was the pioneer in uh, bringing this kind of i say wave in our country india you would imagine a scientific mind to be very quantified uh, very straightforward not believing in uh, intangible possibilities or the mysterious possibilities of the universe you have a mind in professor shikantan which is unique in the sense he has that secret corner somewhere in the mind to accommodate what immediately cannot be understood what immediately cannot be explained well uh, i still remember that uh, beautiful fine morning at nias when i first uh, met professor shikantan and that was immediately after a brief meeting with uh, dr raja ramanna and he introduced me to professor shikantan uh, saying that here is a person uh, who is completely devoted to bringing science and philosophy together and i was amazed uh, by such a reference in the beginning because uh, at that time this is uh, 90 Uh, 5 1995 i have not heard of many people in science trying to work on consciousness or understand the deeper mysteries of human mind uh, and uh, i should say that the consciousness studies program in nias started only because of professor shikantan's interest and if it has grown to such an extent today that's because of his leadership to allow new people to come and initiate new work and to also trust them uh, with new responsibilities perhaps that's because he has the passion to do something new nias being a multidisciplinary institution uh, it has encouraged lots of um, researchers working in multidisciplinary field as well as phd students and um, at the time when he was uh, chairperson of phd program uh, every student who had a problem Uh, which happened often we all came from a different field we had our bachelors or masters in a different field in some cases we didn't have either bachelors or masters and uh, or uh, the university had a problem in accepting this as a new area of research he took personal interest in more than one case he has visited and attended committee meetings in the university representing one student the case of one student and fighting for how and why that particular study is important and probably that particular study can be done only by that student because of his multiplicity of his background so he took all of us personally and personal interest in all of us he has looked through uh, till very recently he has looked through every phd uh, proposal every phd thesis he has attended every phd colloquium asked pertinent questions and uh, it amazes us sometimes we uh, we sit through colloquiums whole day and by the third or fourth we lose we are not able to be as attentive as in the beginning whereas he can he can and he can ask pertinent question even at the last presentation at the evening one of the things that has struck me the most about professor bibi shikanthan is his commitment to the development of the institution I have seen how deeply he cares that nias whatever the people at nias do be one of the premier institutions in those fields he is always striven and encouraged all of our students and faculty that we be at the cutting edge of what we do and that we do it in the best way i remember how there was this book in the library a book by the italian indologist roberto calasso that uh, the library had got because i had ordered it and uh, he came and he saw it in the display section and he went up to the librarian and asked her if he could issue it 
and the, when the librarian mentioned that this this person has ordered for it so they have first rights to borrow it he made a point of making sure that i didn't want it before he got them to issue them he didn't need to do that and we all we all would have just let him take it but he made a point of insisting that they ask me first and that i gave the go ahead and then he issued the book for himself this is uh, again very rare the other thing that i think is remarkable about him is the spirit of institutional collegiality there has been no talk that he has missed he would attend all the talks you might think that he is dozing off or meditating but he would be listening with his eyes closed and at the end typically would have a searching and cogent question a question about the larger relevance of the research the relevance of it for society and so on any criticism would always be given in the most gracious way in the most constructive way and i think these are traits of professor shrikantan that we would all like to emulate but he has set the standard really really high i have been uh, seeing professor b v shrikantan since 1995 the year in which i joined nias and in the recent years i have been interacting with him in my capacity as head of the administration um what inspires me even today is that his uh, punctuality time sense and participation in nias events uh, he is the first person to come to nias he generally makes it by 9:30 and he ensures that he remains till uh, 4:30 also whenever there is an event in nias again he is the first person i could see him in the lecture or particularly when the wednesday talk is arranged so it has been always a pleasure to me to uh, work with him uh, apart from project in fact uh, he has been guiding me in nias finances also rather so i never had any difficulty and uh, his uh, advices were always of great help to me and it was so smooth to work with him we are all aware of uh, scientific contributions of professor shrikantan we are all aware of his administrative uh, uh, contributions in science administration in nurturing young scientists and so on but one of the facets which not many people may be aware of the most important person in his life who has played a seminal role in making professor shrikantan what he is and that is mrs shrikantan who unfortunately passed away about 10 years back mrs shrikantan was a total contrast from professor shrikantan uh while professor shrikantan is always a very calm serene person she was always uh, full of wit humor laughter and uh, somehow she played a role which when whenever she was around the mood will lighten up uh, i remember her visits to uti uh when we would be making all night observations for months together and the family members would be exhausted because uh, the male members will come tired in early in the morning sleep through the day and they are never available and when mrs shrikantan saw sullen faces the first thing did she did was to plan a picnic took everybody out and uh, she kept inquiring about uh, what are the problems they are facing and she gave us a stern message don't just do science take care of family also without family there will be no science and i cannot forget that that balance in life is so important science is important but personal life also is equally important and i think uh, mrs shrikantan in some sense is what made professor Shri shrikantan who he is he never put any pressure on us that's one thing i think he never either neither i nor my brother ever felt uh, you know that we had to do something or we had to study or this. he never really neither neither of my parents did that they never put any pressure and as it turned out both of us got interested in science i mean i got into mathematics my brother got into physics and uh, somehow yeah so he was always there as a person whom we looked up to as a sort of a some level a role model in something something to follow but uh, he never himself told us to do anything in particular and so on and so forth as a child well he was always kind of busy so he would be in he, he was very disciplined that's all i remember so he would get up very early in the morning around 5:30 or 6 and then go for a walk then come back and then have breakfast and around by 9 he would be in the institute and from 9 then he would come back at around 1 1:30 for lunch then he would take a short nap between 2 and 2:10 while listening to the radio 
he would keep the radio on his uh, chest and you know we listening to the 2 o'clock news go out, take a short nap during that period wake up at the end of the news and then go back to work and come back around 5:30 or 6 yeah then he would watch really bad television for some <laughs> some time and sleep by around i think by 10 he would always sleep so he's been very disciplined that way i mean that's one thing which i admire in him which i perhaps haven't picked up but uh, he's always maintained a very proper discipline schedule and doesn't do anything to excess and doesn't do uh, you know very careful with what he eats careful with what he make sure he does his exercise regularly and so on even at this age the other thing which i always find i mean i always like to say when i talk about fathers see when i went to graduate school i was full of myself and thought you know okay i'll do my phd in 3 or 4 years and you know have a great career and so on and i remember after 2 or 3 years i was struggling in graduate school in chicago and you know i, I remember being somewhat arrogant when i was leaving home saying you know what we do is serious stuff what you did is you know and uh, you know he came and he came for some work to chicago and we were talking and walking and some of the staff in him helped me a lot to get over this so i realized you know there's this statement of uh, mark twain he said uh, when i was a lad of 14 i was amazed by how ignorant my father was at the age of 21 i was amazed how much the man had learned in 7 years because he does certain things on his own so this morning coffee he makes it himself at whatever early in the morning and yeah and so i have this hand grinder and so he uses that every morning and he makes enough for so that's another part of his discipline i think he, he it's a fairly recent thing in last year and a half and i got that grinder but every morning he'll grind the beans so that they're fresh and ready for uh, for coffee and he'll make enough for for the day so um, yeah so those kind of things and he is particular about such things yeah the one thing i learned from my dad is uh, humility he never you know brags almost i've never seen him unless you push him really hard he will never you know compliment himself right if you really you really criticize him then maybe you might get a glimpse <laughs> but but otherwise you know there's just self effacing personality there's even at home so some people have this two faced thing outside they're one way and at home they're completely different this is not the case sometimes because i told you i was a lazy guy always he would drag me to go for a walk with him in the morning every day he would go like from around 7 o'clock till uh, actually 6:30 till about uh, 8 right for almost 5 months so one one such okay you know on such occasions he would drag me to go with him and um, then we would talk about physics so he would tell me about uh, how you know classical physics had its limitations and quantum mechanics became very important all this stuff when i was in like probably ninth grade or eighth grade when you know you're not supposed to <laughs> know all this stuff but you would so i had this background even though i didn't know the technical uh, the mathematics behind it or the technical aspects i understood the concepts because of this discussion and the mindset you see it's it's uh, to question things to to realize that even the smartest people struggled with concepts you know and with uh, they didn't understand well the thing is he would always even now he does this he would always relate the you know the discoveries in physics and uh, particle physics especially and uh, cosmology to ancient hindu philosophy yeah he uh, very rarely you know he but you could tell he's a very uh, deeply emotional person you know he hides it pretty effectively but it comes up sometimes so uh, um yeah my mother's death was not a good thing i mean definitely she he was very although they kind of expected with the first when the first stroke happened that it might happen but you know it was sudden so um yeah he still i mean he still every day in the evening there's my there's a picture of my mother there he lights up a incense stick and he puts it in front of her every evening without fail yeah. i mean he worships her basically so professor bv srikantan jain nyas to my mind getting attracted 
with the work personality and the iconic nature of dr raja ramana dr raja ramana was the first director of national institute of advanced studies i don't think nyas would have attracted him if dr raja ramana was not here he picked up an area about 20 years back consciousness which after 25 years is considered as a frontier of science and consciousness is truly interdisciplinary i think it goes to the credit of professor bv srikanthan that when nyas was being talked as a interdisciplinary institute by jrd tata and raja ramana he chose a area which undoubtedly is interdisciplinary to the largest extent here you have a role of the quantum physics you have a role of mathematician you have a role of the neuro physicist neuro chemist you have a role of the philosophers you have the role of social sciences you have the role of the scriptures the religious people and all that so very imagination of a program which didn't exist perhaps anywhere was the mind of bv srikanthan and i think just the presence of bv srikanthan inspires us to do more and when our young students come and they get admitted to nyas i think the first person to my mind which attracts them is professor bv srikanthan today everybody says that the eminence the work should be combined with humility and ethics but truly if you really look in life how many are there who are able to combine eminence ethics values inspiration being humble then you find that there are a few like uh, professor bv srikanthan he would not talk uh, make much fuss about what should be the value system like most of the people do today he is a silent demonstrator that how to live a life actually those who are aware of what gita describes i think it is example by which you live which is the two way of passing on your understanding of life is rare of the rarest example who has demonstrated over a long period his uh, uh, actual scientific work now is about uh, nearly 70 years he joined uh, in 1947 tifr 70 years you demonstrate the excellence human values ethics and build the institute and build the people is remarkable whenever i think that i have to take a decision and i am finding myself inadequate to take a decision i just walk to his room and sit opposite to him and discuss whatever is in my mind whether it would be in the interest of nyas and he is in a very sagacious way would tell straight way that this is good for nyas this we should be doing this we should not be doing see we take great pride in the doctoral program of nyas because it's a very unique program and we get some of the best people and uh, nyas is very fortunate that uh, he of course excels in consciousness he has brought together the quantum mechanics the philosophy the neurosciences scriptures all into it but to me he is much beyond consciousness he is he is teaching us how nyas should be conscious institute <laughs> if if we can take and learn that much from him i think we would have done justice to his spending almost uh, close to 30 years with the
perhaps let me start with you, Professor Mishuna. Uh, uh, you know, Professor Shrikantan was an experimental physicist. He worked both on the macro and micro aspects of the universe. And uh, crossing the experiments were the route to do this in the early days of uh, quantum physics. In your own words, uh, he was a pioneer and an enthusiastic experimenter. Can you talk a bit about this, the experimental side of chicken? Yeah, um, thank you. Uh, what I should realize, like uh, Dr. Balvin uh, said just at the very end, it was 1947 when he started. And uh, we had become independent just then. And the youth was full of enthusiasm. And Sri Kattan was a prime example of such youth. And at that time, when we wanted to do research as uh, Sikashik said, it is Baba's uh, thing, and uh, Srikant also said that. So uh, he asked him to do certain experiments, which were very fundamental in nature. And uh, actually most of the experiments he did were fundamental in nature, that's different. But the ones he did were, for example, for some of the people who, may, who know here, who are here, of the lifetime of mu meson. See, it's a uh, mu meson is a particle, but meson uh, dropped out later, we call it mu today. So uh, there were conflicting results, and Sri Kanta did uh, what I was told, what Dr. Chatterjee, one of our senior physicists, uh, what we call, who we call the conscious of the group, he said a wonderful experiment. Similarly, uh, a year or two later, he had to do another experiment with beyonds underground. And uh, I think probably Professor Kaushik could have said some of these things. I'm saying it. So um, he had to make GM counters, he had to make do electronics for everything. And uh, he, he himself talked about it. I don't know how much you heard that he had to go to uh, Chor Bazaar in Bombay with Raja Ramana and uh, so big things and you know, at that time war surplus was there. So she got this experiment, he had to be a pioneer. There was absolutely no other choice there. And by nature also he was like that, I think. And uh, so the pioneer in nature comes there. And the enthusiasm is he was, uh, he was uh, always, very enthusiastic about things. I want to say one more about one more field, actually, which we're not talked about. Uh, it's called Gabriel astronomy. He started that also, in which I was involved at a later date. You see, what happened was uh, it was a, a very uh, difficult, difficult type of experiment. And in 1968, pulsars were discovered, and there was a way to we thought increase the signal to noise ratio, you know, just putting it uh, very simply. And these people did the experiment with just two mirrors, which are not bigger than these here. And uh, they wrote papers, they came out in nature and all that. And the sheer naivety is, you know, it was, it's very, very naive when you look back because today, the experiments are done with uh, thousands of meters of meters. But what you got to understand is the enthusiasm behind it. These guys went ahead and I read about it, how they started. I was not there at the time. Uh, that is what Sri Kutta's enthusiasm was. And I would like to give uh, one more this thing of how he used to work. And uh, like he was the director at that time, and uh, we were, and I. Uh, I was working on some of these experiments. He would come early in the morning and sit with me. And uh, the daytime, of course, he was busy with administration. Again, in the evening, he would come and sit with me. And he would never miss any group meetings or anything like that. And he would. what I really liked in him was he encouraged out-of-box thinking. Okay. That was uh, uh, very necessary for some of these fields to grow in uh, TFR and in the country. 
let me come to Professor Roy. Uh, so you are an accomplished physicist and an applied mathematician yourself. Uh, and you have a deep understanding of uh, quantum mechanics, brain function modeling, and data analysis. How did you come to meet Professor Shrikantan and get drawn to this study of consciousness? Uh, okay. Uh, my field of uh, expertization was different from Professor Shrikantan's field of expertization. So I, I, though I heard his name, but uh, I did not meet him in my early age, around two, 2000, I think. There was a conference in Ramakrishna Mission Gold Park in Calcutta. And uh, it was the first conference, international conference on consciousness. So Professor Srikantan was there as a speaker. And uh, I criticized him severely in the conference. After the end of the conference, I was just roaming here and there. Uh, then he called me near reception desk and uh, we spoke some words among us. Uh, that time I was not very aware what, uh, I mean, how deep his interest in consciousness had. Because the lecture he gave, it was a very preliminary lecture. Then in 2013, Professor Sikantan wrote me a letter that, uh, uh, why don't you arrange a national conference on interdisciplinary subjects like consciousness, biology, quantum physics, etc. And uh, told me that whether you can act as one of the organizers of the conference. So I agreed it and I came to Nias, gave a talk and we had some discussions. Then in 2014, as I was superannuated from my earlier institute, Indian Statistical Institute, Calcutta. I talked to Professor Sikantan that uh, whether uh, I can continue the research on consciousness, quantum theory, and neuroscience in NIAS. He immediately uh, told yes, it's possible. And uh, that time, Professor Ramurthy was the director of the NIAS. And he talked to him and offered me a uh, special chair. And uh, after a few months, I joined NIAS, and then we started talking to each other. Right. Uh, let me come to you, Dr. Sinha. Uh, see, the study of consciousness is the exact the trisection of uh, physics, philosophy, and biology. Uh, you are a celebrated primatologist. <laughs> who understands neuroscience very deeply. Uh, how did Srikantan learn the biology of all this? And uh, what were his academic views on consciousness? Yeah, uh, thank you. I don't know how to answer that question, except to say that Professor Srikantan knew everything. And what I mean by that is that his sense of wonder was so strong that any field, that he was interested in, he was able to grasp some of its basic tenets just through reading and thinking about it and talking to people who might perhaps be able to inform him. About consciousness, you know, his favorite statement, whenever anyone asked him, how would you define consciousness, Professor Shikantan? He would say, there are 124 definitions, which one would you want? And why are there 124 definitions? Because 124 people have worked on them, have worked on it and published about it. And then he would smile and he had that gentle smile and the twinkle in his eyes. He said, consciousness is 124 things if you look at it from different perspectives. But ultimately, he had a belief that somewhere there was a unified mechanism that could explain all these manifestations of con consciousness. So he was interested, as uh, Professor Roy just said, in the very fundamental physics, maybe the quantum physics of consciousness. And he felt that that would be ultimately what would explain the mechanism. But that didn't stop him from being interested in knowing where the monkeys, 
that I studied were conscious. And so we would have long discussions and he would try and understand what I was defining as consciousness in these monkeys. And he would debate that with me. But I think what I found remarkable was that at a time when many biologists uh, thought consciousness was a mythical sort of phenomenon that no one would ever understand, Professor Shikanton's faith in believing that one day, however diverse its manifestations might be in any being, one or any, any cell or tissue or in the brain, one day we would understand what it is to be conscious. I think that faith um, and that, again, as I, I would repeat, that sense of wonder where he would read and reread and think and rethink and frequently engage in debates because he felt that by gathering these different viewpoints, he would one day be able to unify them and try and understand what it really stood for. Wonderful. Thank you for that, uh, Professor Sina. Uh, Professor Kaushik, can you hear us? I, I possibly have two questions for you straight off, and let me start with the first one. Huh? Okay. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you have interacted uh, very closely with uh, Professor Shrikantan that comes through in the documentary. Uh, in your foreword to his uh, biography, you write that uh, he made pioneering contributions to cosmic rays, neutrino physics, and X-ray astronomy. All three were forerunners to, or they ran parallel to three Nobel Prize winning efforts. This was probably because he had the scientific intuition to pursue the right scientific investigations at the right time. These are your words. Can you describe this a bit more for the audience here? Yeah, certainly. Certainly, um, I should tell you that um, my first encounter with him was uh, when I had just joined the uh, Tata Institute. Uh, I joined uh, Professor Yeshpal's group and uh, within a very short time, probably a month or so after my joining, Yeshpal left for a sabbatical to Denmark to work with Bernard Peters. And Srikantan in his uh, all knowing way, he said, there is a graduate student hanging around, not doing very much in his thought, but he seems to understand high energy interactions. Why doesn't he work in my group? He invited me very warm and friendly. So I said, I started working in his group. There I saw the broad spectrum of his scientific interests. They ranged from cosmic rays and cosmic ray interactions. And um, he was a pioneer in many, many fields. In fact, um, even though I wrote no papers with him for the next 40 years, he instilled in me the essential germ of these three fields that I mentioned, cosmic rays, neutrinos, and uh, X-ray astronomy, and uh, these were before major advances were made in these fields, very much before the major advances. In fact, uh, his interest in neutrinos and deep underground physics at uh, KGF got me started uh, doing theoretical work on this, and his work on air showers in Wuti got me working on theoretical aspects of uh, extensive air showers. And uh, his interest in X-ray astronomy uh, also uh, made me work on very many aspects of X-ray and also gamma ray astronomy from a theoretical perspective. So he had a kind of a prescience about what was to come. And I should mention one of his major contributions, which really led to major advances in extra astronomy was uh, the collimator. How to identify the location of X-ray sources. This he did at MIT. So 
he he was well connected with the field and as uh, many people including um, uh, professor sinha mentioned uh, he had a great deal of knowledge and he continuously was uh, reading things and he kept abreast of the latest developments in the field and intuitively could go a few step forward that was his uh, remarkable ability and uh, of course i didn't continue to work with sri kantan very soon ashpal came back for a short stint back to tfr and he put me back on track uh, studying high energy interactions but if you look at my phd thesis they contain details of uh, neutrino astronomy extensive air showers and uh, other aspect neutrino fluxes and so forth which was uh, dear to shrikantan's heart right right uh, we will be going on to some of uh, his mentorship qualities in a few minutes but uh, i thought i should mention that uh, at mit he had uh, professor rossi and in india he had homi baba as his mentors and i think these play a very big role in anybody's life would you want to say anything on that yeah certainly uh, certainly um, homi baba is a kind of a universal mentor i would say and um, not to uh, undermine rossi rossi should have actually got the nobel prize for x ray astronomy as well and unfortunately he was not uh, around when the nobel prizes were um, provided but he was a deep figure who had contributed um, to the essential development of uh, the field of x ray astronomy and i don't want to go into the full, full history of it but let me come back to baba baba was a you know, tremendous uh pioneer in high energy interactions and in cosmic ray studies and had predicted the existence of uh the pion and he had proven before the second world war in by 1939 that pions would decay and they would generate uh, neutrinos in the atmosphere and it was uh baba who put shrikantan on to work deep underground to measure muons which are arising from cosmic ray interactions and the very first thing is to measure the muon lifetime accurately and then measure their fluxes deep underground these were truly pioneering things given uh, a greater economic strength had it been that we were economically more powerful those days um some of these nobel prizes would have come to sri kanta thanks professor kaushik um perhaps i'll continue with you uh, and see, many people have uh, highlighted the impact of professor sri kanta on younger colleagues right i mean we did see that on the documentary but uh, how was he perceived by his peers so for example this uh, book by hari talks about uh, how he inspired uh, govind swarup to build the dmrt uh, but it's also true that uh, dr ramana mgk menon yashpal were all contemporaries of uh, shrikantan so how how did they see him oh <laughs> they thought of him as a big brother they thought of him as a benevolent big brother and they would land up always into shrikantan's house whenever uh, they wanted coffee or they wanted uh, some uh, dinner or when they wanted to discuss some science so there was always a little bit of a guest art going on in uh, shrikantan's home and ratna most generous person and uh, yeah fitting partner to professor shrikantan she was a fantastic figure and i i bring her in because you asked me this question 
she played a, such an important role in the lives of these people. They found a warm, comfortable uh, home they could go to and discuss science and quietly they will be working away and magically food and coffee and dosas would appear on the table. And uh, not only in India, when uh, Srikantan and Ratna were in uh, Boston, um, Eshpal would be a constant visitor and uh, Lal was a constant visitor in Bombay to his place. Yes. You know, it's such a remarkable personality, cannot be um, described in few, a few words and few minutes that we have at this meeting. Right. Yeah, but you still did give us a very good glimpse of uh, what life was like during those days and how Srikantan's home was. Um, let me come to you, Professor Vishwanath, now. Um, Hari, in his book, uh, uh, says this, uh, I'm quoting him. Srikantan was a curious mix of attitudes and abilities. He had no compunction of leading a dichotomous life. English and Sanskrit, rituals and rationality, science and religion, classics and communism, rural roots and an urban mindset, physics and electronics. Can you talk a bit about, you know, this basic nature of his quest and all these dualities that seem to exist? Uh, I personally don't see any dichotomy in all this. Uh, that's basically because uh, I think he was trying to get that integrated picture of the universe, okay, in whatever you And, for example, you start from English and Sanskrit. I mean, they're not exclusive. I know there were many people who, I mean, they have found friends, including Professor Kaushik here. They, can, they know a lot of Sanskrit. And uh, so that's not exclusive. And people who read a lot, for example, for them, classics, art communism, Marx, whatever, they, they read everything those days. And that was most scholars of, especially last century, that particular thing. And uh, so I personally do not see, but I'll come to some other things now. Now, the, also you mentioned physics and electronics. It refers to the uh, experimental part here. Now, one could not do physics those days without experimental physics, without electronics. Uh, Trikantan was very well versed in electronics. And when, for example, people like me started, the first thing we did was to learn some electronics. So it was just a route, you know, it was just a step. And later, of course, you know, things changed and uh, people did not have to know electronics, but uh, we all did you know, uh, under the guidance of Shikantan. Now going back, now the uh, thing is about science and religion. Yes, science and religion. Now, the point is that I do not know what he meant by religion there, but we all know, for example, Einstein talks of uh, uh, peace religion being Spinoza's. Okay. Now, Srikantan uh, once asked me to proofread a book called uh, Modern Physics and Advaita. Okay. And uh, not that I know much of either, but so I, I went through that. A lot of Sanskrit was there. And so I asked Nikanta, can you tell me what it is about? And he told me. Anyway, so uh, he he read Shankara earlier days. And also I think this home, uh, this particular influence was there, on the Advaita uh, thing. And so he, he, he probably, he once or twice he told me, he believes in that type of thing. And so if religion is what, for example, Advaita is what he meant by religion. Yes, I mean, uh, he had both. But now come to what we think of religion as rituals, for example. I personally think, I've not seen him uh, very closely, uh, you know, but uh, he, I don't think he took part in any rituals. But the very fact, it's still very moving for me, uh, his death. Uh, there's absolutely no ritual ritual there. It was a very simple ceremony. And I uh, really felt touched by that. And uh, 
So certainly there was no ritual in this, this thing. And if probably there was some ritual, probably he might have gone for a function or something like that as a social thing, which many people do. So going back, I do not see any dichotomy. And uh, in terms of the physics, as uh, has been stressed already, he went for the very fundamental uh, topics and uh, uh, I think his uh, legacy is still around. Yes. Thanks, Professor Vishwana. Uh, to you, Professor Roy, uh, you have written a book with him um, and that's uh, Modern Physics and Ancient Tradition, Traditions. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, Srikantan moved to study consciousness uh, because uh, even though he had spent a lifetime in science, he felt that the current tools in mathematics and physics were not able to explain some of the phenomena. So the two of you wrote this book together and you must have had some very energetic conversations. Could you talk yeah. a bit about that? Uh, you have already heard that after the retirement of uh, Professor Sikantan from TIFR, he, his mind was full of epistemological issues in quantum theory, neuroscience, and ultimately to understand consciousness. So as I joined NIAS in 2014, every day we used to meet and discuss for a few hours. Every day I am telling, not a single day in a week, say five days a week, Every each of five days we used to meet and discuss. He, and he was very passionate to know even the new discovery in physics, new discovery in neuroscience, or some other new insights from Indian philosophical perspective. So as I remember, in 2014, uh, on that conference was in 2014 or 15, 15 December. So uh, there was an international conference on consciousness. So uh, both of us decided whether we can arrange a kind of dialogue in the spirit of Nalanda, Nalanda traditions, that we'll um, invite traditional scholars and we, the scientists, will have a face-to-face -face dialogue on some selected questions. So myself and Professor Sikantan uh, gave enormous time to identify the issues on which the dialogue can be started. So we fixed these kind of issues and send it to many, many traditional scholars from different schools of philosophy, like, uh, you know, Buddhist philosophy, Vedantic philosophy, or uh, yoga and other philosophical schools. Ultimately, six people, we found six people, traditional people, they agreed to come to Nyas and myself and Professor Sikantan was on the dais, and half day of the conference was fully devoted for this kind of issues. And though this half day was not enough, we are not able to complete to discuss all the issues. Then we thought that we should publish this kind of dialogue from the recordings, and this will be really good example of kind of dialogue which persisted in Indian traditions. We approached first, Springer. They told, if you can delete this portion of dialogue, we are ready to publish some of your thoughts. But Professor Sikantan told, no, 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 this is the main focus. We cannot do it. Then we tried Taylor and Francis Rutledge. Uh, they told, okay, we are ready to publish it, but as an appendix. Then I, then Professor Sikantan was a little bit disappointed, but I told, okay, even if, if they publish as an appendix, we should finish the books. And we are trying to finish the books, but his health was deteriorating. He had problem in esophagus. Day by day, his voice was choking. One day, he was sitting in his office and I came in the morning. Uh, he was a little bit uh, not in a good mood. Uh, I, I told that uh, Professor Sikantan, what happened? And uh, I mean, uh, as the elder son of Professor Sikantan told, that though on the outset, he was just like, I mean, maintaining all the decorum, but inside he was very emotional. I, I 
got an example like he he told that you know uh, one of the photographs of my only daughter I normally I kept in my pocket and I bring it every day but today I saw that photo is missing so so I saw him in a very uh, deeply moved of course uh, after few minutes he became a different personality so uh, we are finishing trying to finishing the books and we asked the publisher i asked the publisher that uh, my collaborator professor shikant on health is deteriorating we should try to finish the book as early as possible so that at least he can see the face of the book but uh, they they tried their best but they uh, sent the proof that time professor shikant on in the ramaya hospital and uh, he could not speak i just saw him uh, the cover page and uh, like preface in, in printed matter so he was deeply moved and he told i am grateful to you so he had a different personality because uh, sometimes uh, he was acting like a very hardcore scientist even though he is an experimentalist he tried to understand or even he questioned me some of the problems in foundation of quantum theory and he tried to understand it not only that he had another dream i mean he told i write to finish another book with you that is on the theory of dimensions and indian philosophy uh, i think ramesh knows that dimension theory has been investigated by mathematicians but we we did not have any knowledge whether indian philosophy they discussed uh, the concept of dimension so both of us tried to contact many many traditional philosophers and they told no we don't we don't know whether it has been discussed so ultimately we, we could not finish the books we could not start the books he told after finishing the book let us start the second one so he was he was uh, not in a uh, good uh, mental condition regarding that he is not able to start the writing of the book and one day he told uh, that sishir you know uh, i i i have enjoy i mean his voice was choking he could not speak loudly he told i have enjoyed my life fully so i don't have anything to blame anyone so I, I was moved and uh, i stopped and then went away maybe next day i, I met him yeah you you referred to his daughter uh, yes uh, the audience here some of them may know that uh, he lost his daughter to a very tragic accident yeah. when she was 16 and the book says that uh, he immersed himself in his work to forget that tragedy and some of the big contributions that he made came in that period when he was trying to forget the tragedy so that's just a and since you referred to his last days I, there is another anecdote um apparently ramesh went to see him at the hospital and it was just a day before uh, shrikantan passed away and shrikantan told him he was choking and he said look you know I, just send a mail to the director of nias that i am admitted into hospital and i need a days leave and i will come back yeah 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 <laughs> so in canada there is this phrase called kartavya pragne which i think was very high in him yeah. right uh, professor anind sena i am coming to you now um, um many have talked about uh, you know shikantan's uh, democratic style of leadership and mentorship and all of that you were very close to him and uh, you had a very big role in getting this documentary done uh, what did his friendship mean to you i don't know it's very difficult to say it now and especially after we were talking about his last days it's it's a bit difficult to talk about this but i think he was my mentor not because of the academics that i learned from him but for what he taught me completely quietly and passively just by being himself what he taught me about humanism 
right? Uh, you know, there were some amazing traits. He loved the world. He loved every being in this world. And it's difficult to, uh, I'm being perhaps more voluble than he would ever be. Uh, but I just wanted, this is what I've learned from him, that there was this infinite love for everything that was around him, whether academic or not. Uh, he was an extremely simple man, at least to me. And I could see that his achievements came from his simplicity because he was unencumbered in some sense by anything that drew him back. So in some sense, again, talking about his daughter, I think what he must have learned through that very, very painful experience was a detachment, a sense of detachment, which again, in turn, I think contributed to some traits that I saw in him, his positivity. I never, ever heard him say anything negative about anyone, about anything, any experience that he had had. And even when I went to him and I said, you know, uh, BVS, I'm not very, you know, I don't think this was right. He would smile. And he said, maybe we should talk about your monkeys. Such experiences happen, but I think you should move on. I learned that from him. And finally, I think I remember Somerset Mom, uh, because Somerset Mom writes in one place that uh, he thinks that the rarest quality that he saw in mankind was goodness, simple goodness. And I think I saw Professor Srikantan as just an extremely good man. So touch it. Um, one last question to you, Professor Kaushik, before I turn it to the audience. Um, uh, can you give one illustration of an interaction you had with him which has left a lasting impression on you? Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, you see, the conversations in the last few minutes by the panel um, has uh, brought something to my mind which I should um, tell. We discussed uh, everything from physics to philosophy to literature. Our, uh, he was particularly interested in Bhagavad Gita from his um, college days. And uh, Subramaya, his professor, inculcated this interest in him. And he would discuss each shloka at great detail with his friends those days. Once in Nanjangud, standing under the papal tree next to the Nanjangud temple, he and his friends were discussing the meaning of this following shloka. Karmano hyapi bodhavyam bodhavyam cha vikarmanaha akarmanas cha bodhavyam gahana karmano gatihi how do we translate this? Karmanoho happy bodhavyam is very easy to translate. We should understand how to do our duty. What is our uh, responsibility? It's very straightforward. They are given up, given to us. Bodhavyam cha vikarmanaha. How to do it in a circuitous way or in a different way or in a wrong way? We should understand that. Only then we will be able to do find the best path. We should understand of that also. The third one was akarmanascha bodhavyam. We should know when we should not do anything and just wait for the thing to settle down a little bit. And then the path will be clear. But the final one, gahana karmano gatihi, I don't know how to translate. All these friends were discussing under the papal tree. Then there was a beggar lying on the ground with a sackcloth on his body. He got excited and he had big beard full of mud and dirt. He got up and said, mysterious is the march of destiny, he said. And Sri Kantan said, how come this poor beggar he doesn't seem to be educated, but he seems to be uh, fully knowledgeable about Sanskrit 
and of uh, English as well. He could translate it with so much ease. Then he said, I was in Burma. I was a big timber merchant and had a nice family. And during the war, there was bombing. I lost all my family. I lost all my wealth. I ran away and came here to Nanjingu. And in the, just outside the temple, I am lying here. I would never have expected this to happen. Mysterious indeed is the march of destiny. This story he told me, um, of course, we discussed uh, all aspects of Gita, many aspects of Gita and of uh, Mahavakyas of Shankara and all that very, very regularly. And I am um, interested in Sanskrit and um, so we used to have regular discussion. And, but this particular shloka certainly did leave a lasting impression on me. And of course, this is not the only thing that lasted with me, his whole personality and his whole generosity, his whole uh, simplicity and warmth. And not only his, I always, uh, Ratna, I think of Ratna every time I think of um, uh, Sri Kantan, I think of uh, his family, not just uh, two of them. So it has been a wonderful experience for me, not only scientifically, but uh, somehow prompted uh, for me to go through life uh, in the way, in his footsteps to some extent. Nobody can fill his boots, as they say in English, but um, at least, there is nothing wrong for us to look up to him and somehow try to follow his example as much as we can. Right. Uh, Professor Taushik, uh, uh, please stay back. There could be a question. Uh, there could be a question or two from the audience. So uh, kindly stay back on the line. Uh, Professor Sunil Gupta was supposed to join us, and unfortunately, because of a uh, personal emergency, he could not, but he has uh, sent me one, one anecdote which I think I should place it before you. And he says, uh, sometime in 2007 or thereabouts, uh, there was a conference in Vigyan Bhavan and uh, Dr. Abdul Kalam came and uh, he walked up to the days and uh, in the audience, uh, at fairly some distance, uh, he saw Dr. Shikantan sitting. Dr. Kalam got out, got off this dais and started running towards Shikantan with the security detail following him because they were wondering what's happening. And Kalam went there, met Shikantan and said, Sir, I've not seen you for so long. Why don't you come and sit with me on the dais? And uh, the security was flummoxed completely. And Shikantan, of course, said, Look, no. Uh, that that wouldn't be required, and uh, that just goes to show how so many people thought so well of it. With that, uh, let me just come to the audience. We possibly have time for two or three questions. The mic has been set up, so whoever has a question, speakers, not for me, uh, but for the speakers, uh, may I request you to come, introduce yourself, and it could be a question, it could even be a comment. Uh, please feel free. Uh, I just, you know, you mentioned there were 124 definitions of consciousness. Uh, is there some way that we can read it or has been has it been put down somewhere? All these uh, definitions or can you tell us a few of the definitions? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know whether there is one comprehensive review anywhere. Uh, I think different people have really different perspectives. So... I'll tell you how I look at it. Um, and since I look at it in my monkeys, I think it's perhaps one of the simplest ways to get consciousness. And uh, one, of course, is that if a being is able to sense its environment, process the information, 
that comes in from the environment and respond appropriately to that stimuli, that would be a very basic definition of consciousness. Going a little further, the way I define it in my monkeys is that there are two aspects. One is if you have a mental state, and it could be a memory, a desire, a thought, anything, then you are perceptually conscious. But if you can think and ruminate on that mental state, then you are perhaps reflectively conscious. And what is fascinating is that I know I'm reflectively conscious because I know I can think about my thoughts. If I didn't talk to you and you never spoke to me about your thoughts, I would never be able to know whether you were reflectively conscious. And that, I think, is the primary reason why we do not know even today whether a non-human being is conscious or not, at least reflectively conscious or not. So, so, so that's just a very simple biological way of looking at it. And Professor Shrikantan and I, I remember, we used to debate at length about these definitions because I told him that, look, you should be able to tell me as an outsider why you think a monkey is conscious or whether it's not conscious. And so it was really wonderful to have those discussions with him because he was so open to anything that was said. And even if he was critical, he was so mild and so gentle that you never thought you were being criticized. <laughs> Thank you. I enjoyed the lecture. I think it's been great questioning as well. And I want to address this question to both Mr. Sinai and Mr. Roy. Uh, when we are talking about introduce yourself, please. When we are talking about consciousness, yeah, in spiritual terms, the consciousness is defined as energy. Yeah, universal consciousness and cosmic consciousness is equal to God. Yeah, but in quantum physics, as you defined, you know how do you process it and reflect on it, etc. But you did mention at some stage that there is a unity among them. Would you like to elaborate on this uh, unity? Both of you are uh, quite uh, aware of what, he, what his thoughts were and what was his thinking on this whole subject of the unity between quantum physics and spiritual consciousness. I mean, uh, you see the questions people are debating for more than 50 years or, or since the perception of uh, quantum theory in late 20, 1927-28. But what uh, my personal feelings, even I discussed these things with Professor Sikantan in great depth. This is still a question that how or whether consciousness is at all relevant to quantum theory. We do not know. And if you look at the spirit from the Indian philosophical perspective, say Advaita perspective, ultimate reality, according to Advaita Vedanta, is pure consciousness. But according to Kashmiri Shaivism, they say consciousness is energy. But question again is, is energy, we know as a physicist that energy is physical. But uh, before manifestation, how do I say that is physical or non-physical. So these are the questions even discussed within Indian philosophical systems. The main question is that if consciousness is not energy, then how can we think of interactions with consciousness and matter? I can say very honestly, up till now, a quantum physicist or neuroscientist, they don't have any answer for it. Please come on. If you, if you could introduce yourself and then ask. Yeah, sure. My name is Sabina. And thank you very much for this discussion. Thank you to all of you because I didn't never knew about Professor Shrikantan, but it's great to know of such eminent scientists um, and would love to read more. Um, I guess my question is connected to the former questions. 
Um, and it's a very layman question, uh, so please don't mind. Uh, but as I understand consciousness, at least the ultimate consciousness or what the scriptures uh, talk about being an enlightened state is, is more like a state of realization or a state of experience. And we have heard some descriptions of that state where people like artists, you know, famous artists or musicians almost kind of have access and are able to download some great works of art or music or even scientists are, you know, just accidentally able to, you know, uh, have an aha moment and things open up. So I was just curious that uh, how can such a state, uh, I, and I understand what Professor said when you say like a reflective consciousness or perception consciousness, to that extent of consciousness, yes, potentially it's measurable because it, it still falls under, under the realm of cognition. But beyond that, uh, as an, uh, you know person who's really completely conscious, uh, is it possible to bring it uh, within the, the bounds of scientific uh, logic and doing it? Or is it out of bounds of logic and reason? Uh, and the last sort of addendum there is just this idea of thought. Like, are we reducing somewhere in this, uh, this discussion or in this study consciousness just to the uh, boundaries of thought and thought consciousness? So, Professor Anindya and Professor Roy, if both of you can take this question. Uh, that's very profound. I really don't have an answer. But uh, again, given the limitations of my thinking process as a simple biologist, and for a biologist, definitions are very important. So because if I can't define a particular phenomenon, I don't know how to study it, right? So I think there are certain aspects of consciousness in very popular thinking and that each of us experience, which perhaps still lies beyond the realms of science as we know it today. So, and I'll tell you very simply this. So if you now, uh, you know, if you marvel at the documentary that you saw and you thought about Professor Srikantan in certain ways, your thoughts or your reflections or your feelings would be unique, right? So maybe they wouldn't be like anything that anyone else in this room would respond the way they have responded, right? The Problem is, of course, that five minutes later, your own thoughts and reflections would be very different from the what it was five minutes earlier. The problem is, how would I ever know? You would be limited to express what you thought consciously, if I may just use the term, to me, because you're limited by your vocabulary. You're also limited by not just the language, but your capacity to express the the deepest feelings that you had. And I, standing outside, would never know that. So in some sense, therefore, there are certain aspects of consciousness popularly called qualia, which seem to be beyond exploration, scientific exploration as we know it. Uh, since uh, Professor Roy mentioned the 2015 conference, this was again something, a debate that I had with Professor Shrikantan. Uh, a student of mine and I wrote a paper in that conference volume where we suggested very provocatively that as biologists, we do away completely with the word consciousness. And the reason is because, as she asked, that there are 124 definitions. Would we ever have one integrated definition that would be acceptable to all? And as a biologist, I have this limited view that consciousness was born in me when I was born and it would die with me when I die. I do not know what universal consciousness is. I'm completely ignorant of that. Therefore, I was wondering whether it's not possible to define certain capacities of the brain, certain processes in the brain, which may or may not have give rise to what we call consciousness, but which nevertheless produce phenomena that go under the name of cognition, right? So conceptualizations, different kinds of reflections, different kinds of processes, some mathematical, some perhaps philosophical, all that these processes that our brain is able to achieve have perhaps scientific definitions. Could we not then go down to that level and define those particular processes which can be measured, which can be understood perhaps, and perhaps they together make up consciousness because each being is unique. And I don't know what is common to each of us in this room. So Roy, would you like to add something? Yeah. 
and after that we will close it. Okay. As a physicist, we believe, even up till now, that everything in the universe can be explained in terms of laws of physics. Okay. Now, uh, when you say qualia or subjective experience, that is that that is not explained by laws of physics. We say that the paradigm is not totally exhausted. Professor Srikanthan also did believe that. So if at a certain instant or certain state, we say that uh, laws of physics are not valid or laws of physics not adequate to explain all these things, we'll say, well, either you need new physics or the current paradigm of science has to be changed. So we say that we are not yet reached to the position we say that we have exhausted the paradigm and say, no, it can be, it cannot be explained. Right. Can I just add one small anecdote? Uh, so Professor Shrikantan and I would have this very interesting debate when I would tell him that you're a physicist. So your philosophy is very different from mine as a biologist. And he would say, what do you mean? So I said, look, I'm a common sense realist and you're not. And he would say, why do you say that? I said, because you tell me that this table is 99.99999% vacuum. But I'll tell you that if I hit it hard, it hurts. Why doesn't that 99.999% vacuum protect me from that pain? So it's that point, not, 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 not 1% of that material or matter that's there that I'm more concerned about, not the remaining vacuum. Because as a biologist, I need to look at the matter, not at the vacuum. So this was a debate we had and we would laugh. And of course, um, <laughs> he would say, all right, one day we will resolve this. <laughs> so with that, uh, uh, I just don't want to hold up everybody's time. So with that comment of Anindya, we will draw this to a close. And uh, there are many people to thank for this event. Uh, but I would certainly... Uh, like to acknowledge the National Institute of Advanced Studies for allowing us to screen this documentary and the Bangalore International Center for co-hosting this. Thank you very much and have a nice day.